Chapter 3 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams. Chapter 3 For days Lucian lay in a swoon of pleasure, smiling when he was addressed, sauntering happily in the sunlight, hugging recollection warm to his heart. Annie had told him that she was going on a visit to her married sister and said, with a caress, that he must be patient. He protested against her absence, but she fondled him, whispering her charms in his ear till he gave in, and then they said good-bye, Lucian adoring on his knees. The parting was as strange as the meeting, and that night, when he laid his work aside, he let himself sink deep into the joys of memory. All the encounter seemed as wonderful and impossible as magic. "'And you really don't mean to do anything about those rascals?' said his father. "'Rascals? Which rascals? Oh, you mean bite. I had forgotten all about it. No, I don't think I shall trouble. They're not worth powder and shot.' And he returned to his dream, pacing slowly from the meddler to the quince and back again. It seemed trivial to be interrupted by such questions. He had not even time to think of the book he had recommenced so eagerly, much less of this labor of long ago. He recollected without interest that it cost him many pains, that it was pretty good here and there, and that it had been stolen, and it seemed that there was nothing more to be said on the matter. He wished to think of the darkness in the lane, of the kind voice that spoke to him, of the kind hand that sought his own, as he stumbled on the rough way. So far it was wonderful. Since he had left school and lost the company of the worthy barbarians who had befriended him there, he had almost lost the sense of kinship with humanity. He had come to dread the human form as men dread the hood of a cobra. To Lucian, a man or a woman meant something that stung, that spoke words that rankled, and poisoned his life with scorn. At first such malignity shocked him. He would ponder over words and glances, and wonder if he were not mistaken, and he still sought now and then for sympathy. The poor boy had romantic ideas about women. He believed they were merciful and pitiful, very kind to the unlucky and helpless. Men, perhaps, had to be different. After all, the duty of a man was to get on in the world, or, in plain language, to make money, to be successful to cheat rather than to be cheated, but always to be successful. And he could understand that one who fell below this high standard must expect to be severely judged by his fellows. For example, there was young Bennet, Miss Spurry's nephew. Lucian had met him once or twice when he was spending his holidays with Miss Spurry, and the two young fellows compared literary notes together. Bennet showed some beautiful things he had written, over which Lucian had grown both sad and enthusiastic. It was such exquisite magic verse, and so much better than anything he ever hoped to write, that there was a touch of anguish in his congratulations. But when Bennett, after many vain prayers to his aunt, threw up a safe position in the bank and betook himself to a London garret, Lucian was not surprised at the general verdict. Mr. Dixon, as a clergyman, viewed the question from a high standpoint, and found it all deplorable, but the general opinion was that Bennett was a hopeless young lunatic. Old Mr. Gervais went purple when his name was mentioned, and the young Dixon sneered very merrily over the adventure. "'I always thought he was a beastly young ass,' said Edward Dixon, "'but I didn't think he'd chuck away his chances like that. Said he couldn't stand a bank.' I hope he'll be able to stand bread and water. That's all those literary fellows get, I believe, except Tennyson and Mark Twain and those sort of people. Lucian, of course, sympathized with the unfortunate Bennett, but such judgments were, after all, only natural. The young man might have stayed in the bank and succeeded to his aunt's thousand a year, and everybody would have called him a very nice young fellow, clever, too but he had deliberately chosen, as Edward Dixon had said, to chuck his chances away for the sake of literature. 
Piety and a sense of the main chance had alike pointed the way to a delicate course of wheedling, to a little harmless practicing on Miss Spurry's infirmities, to frequent compliances of a soothing nature, and the young ass had been blind to the direction of one and the other. It seemed almost right that the vicar should moralize, that Edward Dixon should sneer, and that Mr. Gervais should grow purple with contempt. Men, Lucian thought, were like judges, who may pity the criminal in their hearts, but are forced to vindicate the outraged majesty of the law by a severe sentence. He felt the same consideration applied to his own case. He knew that his father should have had more money, that his clothes should be newer and of a better cut, and that he should have gone to the university and made good friends. If such had been his fortune, he could have looked his fellow-men proudly in the face, upright and unashamed. Having put on the whole armor of a first-rate West End tailor, with money in his pocket, having taken anxious thought for the morrow, and having some useful friends and good prospects, in such a case he might have held his head high in a gentlemanly and Christian community. As it was, he had usually avoided the reproachful glance of his fellows, feeling that he deserved their condemnation. But he had cherished for a long time his romantic sentimentalities about women, literary conventions borrowed from the minor poets and pseudo-medievalists, or so he thought afterwards. But, fresh from school, wearied a little with the perpetual society of barbarian, though worthy boys, he had in his soul a charming image of womanhood before which he worshipped with mingled passion and devotion. It was a nude figure, perhaps, but the shining arms were to be wound about the neck of a vanquished knight. There was rest for the head of a wounded lover. The hands were stretched forth to do works of pity, and the smiling lips were to murmur not love alone, but consolation in defeat. Here was the refuge for a broken heart, here the scorn of men would but make tenderness increase. Here was all pity and all charity with loving kindness. It was a delightful picture, conceived in the come rest on this bosom, and a ministering angel thou manner, with touches of allurement that made devotion all the sweeter. He soon found that he had idealized a little. In the affair of young Bennet, while the men were contemptuous, the women were virulent. He had been rather fond of Agatha Gervaise, and she, so other ladies said, had set her cap at him. Now, when he rebelled and lost the good will of his aunt, dear Miss Spurry, Agatha insulted him with all conceivable rapidity. "'After all, Mr. Bennet,' she said, "'you will be nothing better than a beggar now, will you?' You mustn't think me cruel, but I can't help speaking the truth. Write books! Her expression filled up the incomplete sentence. She waggled with indignant emotion. These passages came to Lucian's ears, and indeed the Gervases boasted of how well poor Agatha had behaved. Never mind, Gathy, old Gervase had observed. If the impudent young puppy comes here again— We'll see what Thomas can do with the horsewhip. Poor dear child, Mrs. Gervais added in telling the tale. And she was so fond of him, too. But, of course, it couldn't go on after his shameful behavior. But Lucian was troubled. He sought vainly for the ideal womanly, the tender note of come rest on this bosom. Ministering angels, he felt convinced, do not rub red pepper and sulfuric acid into the wounds of suffering mortals. Then there was the case of Mr. Vaughan, a squire in the neighborhood, at whose board all the aristocracy of Kerman had feasted for years. Mr. Vaughan had a first-rate cook, and his cellar was rare, and he was never so happy as when he shared his good things with his friends. His mother kept his house, and they delighted all the girls with frequent dances, while the men sighed over the amazing champagne. Investments proved disastrous, and Mr. Vaughan had to sell the gray manor house by the river. He and his mother took a little modern stucco villa in Carmen, wishing to be near their dear friends. 
But the men were very sorry. Rough on you, Vaughn. Always thought those Patagonians were risky, but you wouldn't hear of it. Hope we shall see you before very long. You and Mrs. Vaughn must come to tea some day after Christmas. Of course, we are all very sorry for them, said Henrietta Dixon. No, we haven't called on Mrs. Vaughn yet. They have no regular servant, you know, only a woman in the morning. I hear old Mother Vaughn, as Edward will call her, does nearly everything, and their house is absurdly small. It's little more than a cottage. One really can't call it a gentleman's house. Then Mr. Vaughn, his heart in the dust, went to the Gervaises and tried to borrow five pounds of Mr. Gervais. He had to be ordered out of the house, and, as Edith Gervais said, it was all very painful. He went out in such a funny way, she added, just like a dog when he's had a whipping. Of course it's sad, even if it is all his own fault, as everybody says, but he looked so ridiculous as he was going down the steps that I couldn't help laughing. Mr. Vaughn heard the ringing, youthful laughter as he crossed the lawn. Young girls, like Henrietta Dixon and Edith Gervais, naturally viewed the Vaughn's comical position with all the high spirits of their age. But the elder ladies could not look at matters in this frivolous light. "'Hush, dear, hush,' said Mrs. Gervais. "'It's all too shocking to be a laughing matter. Don't you agree with me, Mrs. Dixon? The sinful extravagance that went on at the Penter always frightened me. You remember that ball they gave last year? Mr. Gervais assured me that the champagne must have cost at least a hundred and fifty shillings the dozen. It's dreadful, isn't it? said Mrs. Dixon, when one thinks of how many poor people there are who would be thankful for a crust of bread. Yes, Mrs. Dixon, Agatha joined in, and you know how absurdly the Vaughns spoilt the cottagers. Oh, it was really wicked! One would think Mr. Vaughn wished to make them above their station. Edith and I went for a walk one day nearly as far as Penter, and we begged a glass of water of old Mrs. Jones who lives in that pretty cottage near the brook. She began praising the Vaughns in the most fulsome manner, and showed us some flannel things they had given her at Christmas. I assure you, my dear Mrs. Dixon, the flannel was the very best quality. No lady could wish for better." It couldn't have cost less than half a crown a yard. I know, my dear, I know. Mr. Dixon always said it couldn't last. How often I have heard him say that the Vaughns were pauperizing all the common people about Penter and putting everyone else in a most unpleasant position. Even from a worldly point of view, it was very poor taste on their part, so different from the true charity that Paul speaks of. "'I only wish they had given away nothing worse than flannel,' said Miss Colley, a young lady of very strict views. "'But I assure you there was a perfect orgy, I can call it nothing else, every Christmas. Great joints of prime beef and barrels of strong beer, and snuff and tobacco distributed wholesale, as if the poor wanted to be encouraged in their disgusting habits. It was really impossible to go through the village for weeks after.' The whole place was poisoned with the fumes of horrid tobacco pipes. Well, we see how that sort of thing ends, said Mrs. Dixon, summing up judicially. We had intended to call, but I really think it would be impossible after what Mrs. Gervais has told us. The idea of Mr. Vaughan trying to sponge on poor Mr. Gervais in that shabby way. I think meanness of that kind is so hateful." It was the practical side of all this that astonished Lucian. He saw that, in reality, there was no high-flown quixotism in a woman's nature. The smooth arms, made he had thought for caressing, seemed muscular. The hands meant for the doing of works of pity in his system appeared dexterous in the giving of stingers, as Barnes might say, and the smiling lips could sneer with great ease nor was he more fortunate in his personal experiences. As has been told, Mrs. Dixon spoke of him in connection with judgments, and the younger ladies did not exactly cultivate his acquaintance. 
Theoretically, they adored books and thought poetry too sweet, but in practice they preferred talking about mares and fox terriers and their neighbors. They were nice girls enough, very like other young ladies in other country towns, content with the teaching of their parents, reading the Bible every morning in their bedrooms, and sitting every Sunday in church amongst the well-dressed sheep on the right hand. It was not their fault if they failed to satisfy the ideal of an enthusiastic dreamy boy. And indeed, they would have thought his feigned woman immodest, absurdly sentimental, a fright, never wear stays, my dear, and horrid. At first, he was a good deal grieved at the loss of that charming tender woman, the work of his brain. When the Miss Dixons went haughtily by with a scornful waggle, when the Miss Gervases passed in the wagonette laughing as the mud splashed him, the poor fellow would look up with a face of grief that must have been very comic, like a dying duck, as Edith Gervais said. Edith was really very pretty, and he would have liked to talk to her even about fox terriers, if she would have listened. One afternoon at the Dixons he really forced himself upon her, and with all the obtuseness of an enthusiastic boy tried to discuss the lotus-eaters of Tennyson. It was too absurd. Captain Kempton was making signals to Edith all the time, and Lieutenant Gatwick had gone off in disgust, and he had promised to bring her a puppy by Vic out of Wasp. At last the poor girl could bear it no longer. "'Yes, it's very sweet,' she said at last. When did you say you were going to London, Mr. Taylor?" It was about the time that his disappointment became known to everybody, and the shot told. He gave her a piteous look and slunk off. Just like the dog when he's had a whipping, to use Edith's own expression. Two or three lessons of this description produced their due effect and when he saw a male Dixon or Gervais approaching him, he bit his lip and summoned up his courage. But when he described a ministering angel, he made haste and hid behind a hedge or took to the woods. In course of time, the desire to escape became an instinct, to be followed as a matter of course, in the same way he avoided the adders on the mountain. His old ideas were almost, if not quite forgotten. He knew that the female of the bet humane, like the adder, would in all probability sting, and he therefore shrank from its trail, but without any feeling of special resentment. The one had a poisoned tongue, as the other had a poisoned fang, and it was well to leave them both alone. Then had come that sudden fury of rage against all humanity, as he went out of the carmen carrying the book that had been stolen from him by the enterprising bite. He shuddered as he thought of how nearly he had approached the verge of madness, when his eyes filled with blood and the earth seemed to burn with fire. He remembered how he had looked up to the horizon and the sky was blotched with scarlet, and the earth was deep red with red woods and red fields. There was something of horror in the memory and in the vision of that wild night walk through dim country, when every shadow seemed a symbol of some terrible impending doom. The murmur of the brook, the wind shrilling through the wood, the pale light flowing from the moldered trunks, and the picture of his own figure fleeing and fleeting through the shades, all these seemed unhappy things that told a story in fatal hieroglyphics. And then the life and laws of the sunlight had passed away and the resurrection and kingdom of the dead began. Though his limbs were weary, he had felt his muscles grow strong as steel. A woman, one of the hated race, was beside him in the darkness, and the wild beast woke within him, ravening for blood and brutal lust. All the raging desires of the dim race from which he came assailed his heart. The ghosts issued out from the weird wood and from the caves in the hills, besieging him, as he had imagined the spiritual legion besieging Carmen, beckoning him to a hideous battle and a victory that he had never imagined in his wildest dreams. And then, out of the darkness, the kind voice spoke again, 
and the kind hand was stretched out to draw him up from the pit. It was sweet to think of that which he had found at last, the boy's picture incarnate, all the passion and compassion of his longing, all the pity and love and consolation. She, that beautiful, passionate woman, offering up her beauty in sacrifice to him, she was worthy indeed of his worship. He remembered how his tears had fallen upon her breast, and how tenderly she had soothed him, whispering those wonderful, unknown words that sang to his heart. And she had made herself defenseless before him, caressing and fondling the body that had been so despised. He exulted in the happy thought that he had knelt down on the ground before her, and had embraced her knees and worshipped. The woman's body had become his religion. He lay awake at night looking into the darkness with hungry eyes, wishing for a miracle that the appearance of the so desired form might be shaped before him. And when he was alone in quiet places in the wood, he fell down again on his knees and even on his face, stretching out vain hands in the air as if they would feel her flesh. His father noticed in those days that the inner pocket of his coat was stuffed with papers. He would see Lucian walking up and down in a secret shady place at the bottom of the orchard, reading from his sheaf of manuscript, replacing the leaves and again drawing them out. He would walk a few quick steps and pause as if enraptured, gazing in the air as if he looked through the shadows of the world into some sphere of glory, feigned by his thought. Mr. Taylor was almost alarmed at the sight. He concluded, of course, that Lucian was writing a book. In the first place there seemed something immodest in seeing the operation performed under one's eyes. It was as if the make-up of a beautiful actress were done on the stage, in full audience, as if one saw the rounded calves fixed in position, the fleshings drawn on, the voluptuous outlines of the figure produced by means purely mechanical, blushes mantling from the paint-pot, and the golden tresses well secured by the wig-maker. Books, Mr. Taylor thought, should swim into one's ken mysteriously. They should appear all printed and bound, without apparent genesis. Just as children are suddenly told that they have a little sister, found by Mama in the garden. But Lucian was not only engaged in composition. He was plainly rapturous, enthusiastic. Mr. Taylor saw him throw up his hands and bow his head with strange gesture. The parson began to fear that his son was like some of those mad Frenchmen of whom he had read, young fellows who had a sort of fury of literature, who gave their whole lives to it, spending days over a page and years over a book, pursuing art as Englishmen pursue money, building up a romance as if it were a business. Now Mr. Taylor held firmly by the walking-stick theory. He believed that a man of letters should have a real profession, some solid employment in life. "'Get something to do,' he would have liked to say, "'and then you can write as much as you please. Look at Scott, look at Dickens, and Trollope.' And then there was the social point of view. It might be right, or it might be wrong, but there could be no doubt that the literary man, as such, was not thought much of in English society. Mr. Taylor knew his Thackeray, and he remembered that old Major Pendennis, society personified, did not exactly boast of his nephew's occupation. Even Warrington was rather ashamed to own his connection with journalism, and Pendennis himself laughed openly at his novel-writing as an agreeable way of making money a useful appendage to the cultivation of dukes, his true business in life. This was the plain English view, and Mr. Taylor was no doubt right enough in thinking it good, practical common sense. Therefore, when he saw Lucian loitering and sauntering, musing amorously over his manuscript, exhibiting manifest signs of that fine fury which Britons have ever found absurd, he felt grieved at heart and more than ever sorry that he had not been able to send the boy to Oxford. "'B and C would have knocked all this nonsense out of him,' 
he thought. He would have taken a double first like my poor father and made something of a figure in the world. However, it can't be helped. The poor man sighed and lit his pipe and walked in another part of the garden. But he was mistaken in his diagnosis of the symptoms. The book that Lucian had begun lay unheeded in the drawer. It was a secret work that he was engaged on, and the manuscripts that he took out of that inner pocket never left him day or night. He slept with them next to his heart, and he would kiss them when he was quite alone and pay them such devotion as he would have paid to her whom they symbolized. He wrote on these leaves a wonderful ritual of praise and devotion. It was the liturgy of his religion. Again and again he copied and recopied this madness of a lover, dallying all days over the choice of a word, searching for more exquisite phrases. No common words, no such phrases as he might use in a tale would suffice. The sentences of worship must stir and be quickened, they must glow and burn, and be decked out as with rare work of jewelry. Every part of that holy and beautiful body must be adored. He sought for terms of extravagant praise. He bent his soul and mind low before her, licking the dust under her feet, abased and yet rejoicing as a templar before the image of Baphomet. He exulted more especially in the knowledge that there was nothing of the conventional or common in his ecstasy. He was not the fervent, adoring lover of Tennyson's poems, who loves with passion and yet with a proud respect, with the love always of a gentleman for a lady. Annie was not a lady. The Morgans had farmed their land for hundreds of years. They were what Miss Gervais and Miss Colley and the rest of them called common people. Tennyson's noble gentlemen thought of their ladies with something of reticence. They imagined them dressed in flowing and courtly robes, walking with slow dignity. They dreamed of them as always stately, the future mistresses of their houses, mothers of their heirs. Such lovers bowed, but not too low, remembering their own honor, before those who were to be equal companions and friends as well as wives. It was not such conceptions as these that he embodied in the amazing emblems of his ritual. He was not, he told himself, a young officer, something in the city, or a rising barrister engaged to a Miss Dixon or a Miss Gervais. He had not thought of looking out for a nice little house in a good residential suburb where they would have pleasant society. There were to be no consultations about wallpapers or jocose whispers from friends as to the necessity of having a room that would do for a nursery. No glad young thing had leant on his arm while they chose the sweet and white enamel, and china for our bedroom, and the modest salesman doing his best to spare their blushes. When Edith Gervais married, she would get Mama to look out for two really good servants, as we must begin quietly, and Mama would make sure that the drains and everything were right. Then her girlfriends would come on a certain solemn day to see all her lovely things. Two dozen of everything! Look, Ethel, did you ever see such ducky frills? And that insertion, isn't it quite too sweet? My dear Edith, you are a lucky girl! all the underlinen specially made by Madame Lulu. What delicious things! I hope he knows what a prize he is winning. Oh, do look at those lovely ribbon bows! You, darling, how happy you must be! Real Valenciennes! Then a whisper in the lady's ear and her reply, Oh, don't, Nelly! So they would chirp over their treasures, as in Rabelais they chirped over their cups, and everything would be done in due order till the wedding day, when Mamma, who had strained her sinews and the commandments to bring the match about, would weep and look indignantly at the unhappy bridegroom. "'I hope you'll be kind to her, Robert,' then in a rapid whisper to the bride, Mind, you insist on Wyman's flushing the drains when you come back. Servants are so careless and dirty, too. Don't let him go about by himself in Paris. 
Men are so queer one never knows. You have got the pills." And aloud, after the secreta, "'God bless you, my dear. Good-bye. Cluck-cluck. Good-bye.'" There were stranger things written in the manuscript pages that Lucian cherished, sentences that burnt and glowed like coals of fire which hath a most vehement flame. There were phrases that stung and tingled as he wrote them, and sonorous words poured out in ecstasy and rapture, as in some of the old litanies. He hugged the thought that a great part of what he had invented was in the true sense of the word occult. Page after page might have been read aloud to the uninitiated without betraying the inner meaning. He dreamed night and day over these symbols. He copied and recopied the manuscript nine times before he wrote it out fairly in a little book, which he had made himself of a skin of creamy vellum. In his mania for acquirements that should be entirely useless, he had gained some skill in illumination, or limning, as he preferred to call it, always choosing the obscure word as the obscure arts. First, he set himself to the severe practice of the text. He spent many hours and days of toil in struggling to fashion the serried columns of black letter, writing and rewriting till he could shape the massive character with firm true hand. He cut his quills with the patience of a monk in the scriptorium, shaving and altering the nib, lightening and increasing the pressure and flexibility of the points, till the pen satisfied him and gave a stroke both broad and even. Then he made experiments in inks, searching for some medium that would rival the glossy black letter of the old manuscripts, and not till he could produce a fair page of text did he turn to the more entrancing labor of the capitals and borders and ornaments. He mused long over the Lombardic letters, as glorious in their way as a cathedral, and trained his hand to execute the bold and flowing lines. And then there was the art of the border, blossoming in fretted splendor all about the page. His cousin, Miss Deacon, called it all a great waste of time, and his father thought he would have done much better in trying to improve his ordinary handwriting, which was both ugly and illegible. Indeed, there seemed but a poor demand for the limner's art. He sent some specimens of his skill to an artistic firm in London. A verse of the Maud, curiously emblazoned, and a Latin hymn with the notes pricked on a red stave. The firm wrote civilly, telling him that his work, though good, was not what they wanted, and enclosing an illuminated text. "'We have great demand for this sort of thing,' they concluded, "'and if you care to attempt something in this style, we should be pleased to look at it.' The said text was, "'Thou, God, seest me.' The letter was of a degraded form bearing much the same relation to the true character as a church-warden Gothic building does to Canterbury Cathedral. The colors were varied. The initial was pale gold, the H pink, the O black, the U blue, and the first letter was somehow connected with a bird's nest containing the young of the pigeon, who were waited on by the female bird. "'What a pretty text!' said Miss Deacon. I should like to nail it up in my room. Why don't you try to do something like that, Lucian? You might make something by it. I sent them these, said Lucian, but they don't like them much. My dear boy, I should think not. Like them? What were you thinking of to draw those queer stiff flowers all round the border? Roses? They don't look like roses at all events. Where do you get such ideas from? but the design is appropriate. Look at the words. My dear Lucian, I can't read the words. It's such a queer old-fashioned writing. Look how plain that text is. One can see what it's about. And this other one, I can't make it out at all. It's a Latin hymn. A Latin hymn? Is it a Protestant hymn? I may be old-fashioned, but hymns ancient and modern is quite good enough for me. This is the music, I suppose. But, my dear boy, there are only four lines, and who ever heard of notes shaped like that? 
you have made some square and some diamond shape? Why didn't you look in your poor mother's old music? It's in the ottoman in the drawing-room. I could have shown you how to make the notes. There are crochets, you know, and quavers. Miss Deacon laid down the illuminated herbs Beata in despair. She felt convinced that her cousin was next door to an idiot. And he went out into the garden and raged behind a hedge. He broke two flower-pots and hit an apple-tree very hard with his stick, and then, feeling more calm, wondered what was the use in trying to do anything. He would not have put the thought into words, but in his heart he was aggrieved that his cousin liked the pigeons and the text, and did not like his emblematical roses and the Latin hymn. He knew he had taken great pains over the work, and that it was well done, and being still a young man he expected praise. He found that in this hard world there was a lack of appreciation. A critical spirit seemed abroad. If he could have been scientifically observed as he writhed and smarted under the strictures of the old fool, as he rudely called his cousin, the spectacle would have been extremely diverting. Little boys sometimes enjoy a very similar entertainment. Either with their tiny fingers, or with mamma's nail-scissors, they gradually deprive a fly of its wings and legs. The odd gyrations and queer thin buzzings of the creature as it spins comically round and round never fail to provide a fund of harmless amusement. Lucian, indeed, fancied himself a very ill-used individual. But he should have tried to imitate the nervous organization of the flies, which, as Mamma says, can't really feel. But now, as he prepared the vellum leaves, he remembered his art with joy. He had not labored to do beautiful work in vain. He read over his manuscript once more, and thought of the designing of the pages. He made sketches on furtive sheets of paper, and hunted up books in his father's library for suggestions. There were books about architecture and medieval ironwork, and brasses which contributed hints for adornment. And not content with mere pictures, he sought in the woods and hedges, scanning the strange forms of trees, and the poisonous growth of great water-plants, and the parasite twining of honeysuckle and bryony. In one of these rambles he discovered a red earth which he made into a pigment, and he found in the unctuous juice of a certain fern an ingredient which he thought made his black ink still more glossy. His book was written all in symbols, and in the same spirit of symbolism he decorated it, causing wonderful foliage to creep about the text, and showing the blossom of certain mystical flowers with emblems of strange creatures, caught and bound in rose thickets. All was dedicated to love and a lover's madness, and there were songs in it which haunted him with their lilt and refrain. When the book was finished it replaced the loose leaves as his constant companion by day and night. Three times a day he repeated his ritual to himself, seeking out the loneliest places in the woods, or going up to his room and from the fixed intentness and rapture of his gaze the father thought him still severely employed in the questionable process of composition. At night he contrived to wake for his strange courtship, and he had a peculiar ceremony when he got up in the dark and lit his candle. From a steep and wild hillside, not far from the house, he had cut from time to time five large boughs of spiked and prickly gorse. He had brought them into the house one by one, and had hidden them in the big box that stood beside his bed. Often he woke up weeping and murmuring to himself the words of one of his songs, and then, when he had lit the candle, he would draw out the gorse boughs and place them on the floor, and taking off his nightgown, gently lay himself down on the bed of thorns and spines. Lying on his face, with the candle and the book before him, he would softly and tenderly repeat the praises of his dear, dear Annie, and, as he turned over page after page, and saw the raised gold of the majuscules glow and flame in the candlelight, he pressed the thorns into his flesh. At such moments 
he tasted in all its acute savor the joy of physical pain. And after two or three experiences of such delights, he altered his book, making a curious sign in vermilion on the margin of the passages where he was to inflict on himself this sweet torture. Never did he fail to wake at the appointed hour, a strong effort of will broke through all the heaviness of sleep, and he would rise up, joyful though weeping, and reverently set his thorny bed upon the floor, offering his pain with his praise. When he had whispered the last word, and had risen from the ground, his body would be all freckled with drops of blood. He used to view the marks with pride. Here and there a spine would be left deep in the flesh, and he would pull these out roughly, tearing through the skin. On some nights, when he had pressed with more fervor on the thorns, his thighs would stream with blood, red beads standing out on the flesh and trickling down to his feet. He had some difficulty in washing away the bloodstains so as not to leave any traces to attract the attention of the servant and after a time he returned no more to his bed when his duty had been accomplished. For coverlet he had a dark rug, a good deal worn, and in this he would wrap his naked bleeding body and lie down on the hard floor, well content to add an aching rest to the account of his pleasures. He was covered with scars, and those that healed during the day were torn open afresh at night the pale olive skin was red with the angry marks of blood, and the graceful form of the young man appeared like the body of a tortured martyr. He grew thinner and thinner every day, for he ate but little. The skin was stretched on the bones of his face, and the black eyes burnt in dark purple hollows. His relations noticed that he was not looking well. "'Now, Lucian, it's perfect madness of you to go on like this,' said Miss Deacon one morning at breakfast. "'Look how your hand shakes. Some people would say that you have been taking brandy, and all that you want is a little medicine, and yet you won't be advised. You know it's not my fault. I have asked you to try Dr. Jelly's cooling powders again and again.' He remembered the forcible exhibition of the powders when he was a boy, and felt thankful that those days were over. He only grinned at his cousin and swallowed a great cup of strong tea to steady his nerves, which were shaky enough. Mrs. Dixon saw him one day in Carmen. It was very hot, and he had been walking rather fast. The scars on his body burnt and tingled, and he tottered as he raised his hat to the vicar's wife. She decided without further investigation that he must have been drinking in public houses. It seems a mercy that poor Mrs. Taylor was taken, she said to her husband. She has certainly been spared a great deal. That wretched young man passed me this afternoon. He was quite intoxicated. How very sad, said Mr. Dixon. A little port, my dear. Thank you, Mary Vale. I will have another glass of sherry. Dr. Burroughs is always scolding me and saying I must take something to keep up my energy, and this sherry is so weak. The Dixons were not teetotalers. They regretted it deeply and blamed the doctor, who insisted on some stimulant. However, there was some consolation in trying to convert the parish to total abstinence, or, as they curiously called it, temperance. Old women were warned of the sin of taking a glass of beer for supper. Aged laborers were urged to try Cork Ho, the new temperance drink. An uncouth beverage, styled coffee, was dispensed at the reading room. Mr. Dixon preached an eloquent temperance sermon, soon after the above conversation, taking as his text, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. In his discourse he showed that fermented liquor and leaven had much in common, that beer was at the present day put away during Passover by the strict Jews and in a moving peroration he urged his dear brethren, and more especially those amongst us who are poor in this world's goods, to beware indeed of that evil leaven which was sapping the manhood of our nation. Mrs. Dixon cried after the church, "'Oh, Maryvale, what a beautiful sermon! How earnest you were! I hope it will do good!' 
Mr. Dixon swallowed his port with great decorum, but his wife fuddled herself every evening with cheap sherry. She was quite unaware of the fact, and sometimes wondered in a dim way why she always had to scold the children after dinner. And so strange things sometimes happened in the nursery, and now and then the children looked queerly at one another after a red-faced woman had gone out, panting. Lucian knew nothing of his accuser's trials, but he was not long in hearing of his own intoxication. The next time he went down to Carmen he was hailed by the doctor. "'Been drinking again today?' "'No,' said Lucian in a puzzled voice. "'What do you mean?' "'Oh, well, if you haven't, that's all right, as you'll be able to take a drop with me. Come along in?' Over whiskey and pipes, Lucian heard of the evil rumors affecting his character. "'Mrs. Dixon assured me you were staggering from one side of the street to the other. You quite frightened her,' she said. Then she asked me if I recommended her to take one or two ounces of spirit at bedtime for the palpitation, and, of course, I told her two would be better. I have my living to make here, you know, and upon my word I think she wants it. She's always gurgling inside like waterworks. I wonder how old Dixon can stand it. I like ounces of spirit, said Lucian. That's taking it medicinally, I suppose. I've often heard of ladies who have to take it medicinally, and that's how it's done. That's it. Dr. Burroughs won't listen to me. I tell him how I dislike the taste of spirits, but he says they are absolutely necessary for my constitution. My medical man insists on something at bedtime. That's the style. Lucian laughed gently. All these people had become indifferent to him. He could no longer feel savage indignation at their little hypocrisies and malignancies. Their voices, uttering calumny and morality and futility, had become like the thin, shrill, angry note of a gnat on a summer evening. He had his own thoughts and his own life and he passed on without heeding. "'You come down to Carmen pretty often, don't you?' said the doctor. "'I've seen you two or three times in the last fortnight.' "'Yes, I enjoy the walk.' "'Well, look me up whenever you like, you know. I am often in just at this time, and a chat with a human being isn't bad now and then. It's a change for me. I'm often afraid I shall lose my patience.' The doctor had the weakness of these terrible puns, dragged headlong into the conversation. He sometimes exhibited them before Mrs. Gervais, who would smile in a faint and dignified manner and say, "'Ah, I see. Very amusing, indeed. We had an old coachman once who was very clever, I believe, at that sort of thing, but Mr. Gervais was obliged to send him away. The laughter of the other domestics was so very boisterous.' Lucian laughed, not boisterously, but good-humouredly, at the doctor's joke. He liked Burroughs, feeling that he was a man and not an automatic gabbling machine. "'You look a little pulled down,' said the doctor, when Lucian rose to go. "'No, you don't want my medicine. Plenty of beef and beer will do you more good than drugs. I dare say it's the hot weather that has thinned you a bit.' Oh, you'll be all right again in a month. As Lucian strolled out of the town on his way home, he passed a small crowd of urchins assembled at the corner of an orchard. They were enjoying themselves immensely. The healthy boy, the same whom he had seen some weeks ago operating on a cat, seemed to have recognized his selfishness in keeping his amusements to himself. He had found a poor lost puppy— a little creature with bright, pitiful eyes, almost human in their fond, friendly gaze. It was not a well-bred little dog. It was certainly not that famous puppy by Vic out of Wasp. It had rough hair and a foolish long tail which it wagged beseechingly, at once deprecating severity and asking kindness. The poor animal had evidently been used to gentle treatment, it would look up in a boy's face and give him a leap fawning on him, and then bark in a small, doubtful voice, and cower a moment on the ground, astonished perhaps at the strangeness, the bustle, and animation. The boys were beside themselves with eagerness. 
there was quite a babel of voices, arguing, discussing, suggesting. Each one had a plan of his own which he brought before the leader, a stout and sturdy youth. "'Drown him! What you be thinking of, mum?' he was saying. "'Tain't no spart at all. You shut your mouth, Gwaze. You be going to ask your mother for the boiling water? Is Bob Williams, I do know all that, but where be you a-going to get the fire from? Be quiet, mun, can't you? Thomas Trevor, be this dog yourn or mine? Now look you, if you don't all of you shut your bloody mouths, I'll take the dog home and keep him. There now. He was a born leader of men. A singular depression and lowness of spirit showed itself on the boys' faces. They recognized that the threat might very possibly be executed, and their countenances were at once composed to humble attention. The puppy was still cowering on the ground in the midst of them. One or two tried to relieve the tension of their feelings by kicking him in the belly with their hobnail boots. It cried out with the pain and writhed a little, but the poor little beast did not attempt to bite or even snarl. It looked up with those beseeching friendly eyes at its persecutors, and fawned on them again and tried to wag its tail and be merry, pretending to play with a straw on the road, hoping, perhaps, to win a little favor in that way. The leader saw the moment for his masterstroke. He slowly drew a piece of rope from his pocket. "'What do you say to that, mun? Now, Thomas Trevor, we'll hang him over that there bow. Will that suit you, Bobby Williams?' There was a great shriek of approval and delight. All was again bustle and animation. "'I'll tie it round his neck. Get out, man, you don't know how it be done. Is I do, Charlie. Now let me, Gwaze, now do let me. You be sure he won't bite? He ain't mad, be he? Suppose we were to tie up his mouth first. The puppy still fawned and curried favor and wagged that sorry tail, and lay down crouching on one side of the road, sad and sorry in his heart, but still with a little gleam of hope for now and again he tried to play and put up his face, praying with those fond, friendly eyes. And then, at last, his gambles and poor efforts for mercy ceased, and he lifted up his wretched voice in one long, dismal whine of despair. But he licked the hand of the boy that tied the noose. He was slowly and gently swung into the air as Lucian went by unheeded. He struggled, and his legs twisted and writhed. The healthy boy pulled the rope, and his friends danced and shouted with glee. As Lucian turned the corner, the poor dangling body was swinging to and fro. The puppy was dying, but he still kicked a little. Lucian went on his way hastily and shuddering with disgust. The young of the human creature were really too horrible. They defiled the earth and made existence unpleasant as the pulpy growth of a noxious and obscene fungus spoils an agreeable walk. The sight of those malignant little animals, with mouths that uttered cruelty, and filthy, with hands dexterous in torture, and feet swift to run all evil errands, had given him a shock, and broken up the world of strange thoughts in which he had been dwelling. Yet it was no good being angry with them. It was their nature to be very loathsome. Only he wished they would go about their hideous amusements in their own back gardens where nobody could see them at work. It was too bad that he should be interrupted and offended in a quiet country road. He tried to put the incident out of his mind as if the whole thing had been a disagreeable story, and the visions amongst which he wished to move were beginning to return when he was again rudely disturbed. A little girl, a pretty child of eight or nine, was coming along the lane to meet him. She was crying bitterly and looking to left and right, calling out some word all the time. "'Jack! Jack! Jack! Little Jackie! Jack!' Then she burst into tears afresh and peered into the hedge and tried to peep through a gate into a field. "'Jackie! Jackie! Jackie!' She came up to Lucian, sobbing as if her heart would break and dropped him an old-fashioned curtsy. "'Oh, please, sir, have you seen my little Jackie?' "'What do you mean?' said Lucian. "'What is it you've lost?' "'A little dog, please, sir. 
a little terrier dog with white hair. Father gave me him a month ago and said I might keep him. Someone did leave the garden gate open this afternoon, and he must have got away, sir, and I was so fond of him, sir, he was so playful and loving, and I be afraid he be lost. She began to call again, without waiting for an answer. Jack! 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 I'm afraid some boys have got your little dog, said Lucian. They've killed him. You'd better go back home. He went on, walking as fast as he could in his endeavor to get beyond the noise of the child's crying. It distressed him, and he wished to think of other things. He stamped his foot angrily on the ground as he recalled the annoyances of the afternoon, and longed for some hermitage on the mountains, far above the stench and the sound of humanity. A little farther, and he came to Croswin, where the road branched off to right and left. There was a triangular plot of grass between the two roads. There the cross had once stood, the goodly and famous rood of the old local chronicle. The words echoed in Lucian's ears as he went by on the right hand. There were five steps that did go up to the first pace, and seven steps to the second pace, all of clean-hewn ashlar, and all above it was most curiously and gloriously wrought with thorough carved work. In the highest place was the holy rood, with Christ upon the cross, having Mary on one side and John on the other, and below were six splendid and glistering archangels that bore up the rood, and beneath them in their stories were the most fair and noble images of the twelve apostles, and of diverse other saints and martyrs. And in the lowest story there was a marvellous imagery of diverse beasts, such as oxen and horses and swine, and little dogs and peacocks, all done in the finest and most curious wise, so that they all seemed as they were caught in a wood of thorns, the which is their torment of this life. And here, once in the year, was a marvellous solemn service, when the parson of Carmen came out with the singers and all the people, singing the psalm Benedicite Omnia Opera as they passed along the road in their procession. And when they stood at the rood, the priest did there his service, making certain prayers for the beasts, and then he went up to the first pace and preached a sermon to the people, showing them that as our Lord Jew died upon the tree of his dear mercy for us, and so we too owe mercy to the beasts his creatures, for that they are all his poor lieges and silly servants. And that, like as the holy angels do their suit to him on high, and the blessed twelve apostles and the martyrs and all the blissful saints served him aforetime on earth, and now praise him in heaven, so also do the beasts serve him, though they be in torment of life and below men." for their spirit goeth downward, as holy writ teacheth us. It was a quaint old record, a curious relic of what the modern inhabitants of Carmen called the Dark Ages. A few of the stones that had formed the base of the cross still remained in position, gray with age, blotched with black lichen and green moss. The remainder of the famous rood had been used to mend the roads, to build pigsties and domestic offices, it had turned Protestant, in fact. Indeed, if it had remained, the parson of Carmen would have had no time for the service. The coffee stall, the Portuguese missions, the Society for the Conversion of the Jews, and important social duties took up all his leisure. Besides, he thought the whole ceremony unscriptural. Lucian passed on his way, wondering at the strange contrasts of the Middle Ages. How was it that people who could devise so beautiful a service believed in witchcraft, demoniacal possession and obsession, in the incubus and succubus, and in the Sabbath, and in many other horrible absurdities? It seemed astonishing that anybody could even pretend to credit such monstrous tales, but there could be no doubt that the dread of old women who rode on broomsticks and liked black cats was once a very genuine terror." A cold wind blew up from the river at sunset, and the scars on his body began to burn and tingle. The pain recalled his ritual to him, and he began to recite it as he walked along. 
he had cut a branch of thorn from the hedge and placed it next to his skin, pressing the spikes into the flesh with his hand till the warm blood ran down. He felt it was an exquisite and sweet observance for her sake. And then he thought of the secret golden palace he was building for her, the rare and wonderful city rising in his imagination. As the solemn night began to close about the earth, and the last glimmer of the sun faded from the hills, he gave himself anew to the woman, his body and his mind, all that he was, and all that he had. End of chapter 3